Our, um, our expert participant today is David Heyman, um, who is a professor of infectious diseases and epidemiology. I'm very lucky to have him on today. Um, and David, I'd like to kick off by um, starting close to home, um, getting the latest news the government has extended the lockdown uh, I believe it was sort of happening as we started um, for another three weeks. Can we try and put that into context of where you think we are um, based on the latest numbers um, in, in the pandemic? Are we um, beginning to see plateauing of death rates and, and where do you, what's your best guess as to, as to what the next couple of weeks look like? Well, thanks, Paul. Um, you know, I think that what everybody has learned, every country has learned, is that forced physical distancing is very effective in decreasing transmission. And so we're seeing in the UK, as in most other countries with forced physical separation or forced physical distancing, we're actually seeing the incidence of infections decrease. So looking at hospitals, when people become seriously ill and, and, and pass away or recover, they're actually three weeks away from when they were infected, at least. So what we see in hospitals is not a reflection of what's going on in the community. And I believe that in the community, what's being seen is that transmission has been decreasing throughout the UK. And so I think that these measures, um, it's right that they're continued as they are in most other European countries. And I expect that there will be a gradual unlocking or transition, maybe not all um, the same in all parts of the country, but that will depend on some serological surveys that are going on now to determine where transmission has been high and where they might be able to unlock first. And, and David, do you, do you think that um, just on the, on the question of, of, of plateauing, um, I think we've seen a couple of days of sub sub 800 person deaths which is still a staggering number and i think every time we say it's a it sort of causes a little bit of a shock in me that we we shouldn't become inured to the fact that there's a human being behind every single one of those numbers but do you think that we're likely we're likely at or around the peak is that your is that your sense from looking at the numbers I would hope so, based on the, the effectiveness of the lockdown procedures. I would expect we are close to the plateau one way, on one side or the other of it at present. So I think we're, we're close in the UK to being able to say we've plateaued. But remember, what we're seeing are COVID deaths. And unfortunately, there will be other deaths that are occurring as well because of some of the inequalities that have been exaggerated during this period of time. And also just because people can't access healthcare institutions because they're not taking patients right now. They're only taking COVID. So it's a very difficult issue in the UK as in other countries, not just because of the people who are dying with COVID, but also those people who are dying from other diseases which are not able to be managed in health facilities. I want to pivot a little bit. I usually talk about it at the end, but I think there's been some sort of interesting news and developments around, around vaccines. Um, I read a report today that Johnson & Johnson is gearing up to be able to produce um, you know, vast quantities of, of vaccines in, in the first half of 2021 based on their sense that um, they may be close to, to having found something. Can you just give us a sense of, I mean, we always clutch at these sort of reports and then try and figure out how much we can rely on them. But based on what you're looking at, where, where are we on vaccines? Well, Paul, you know, there are many, many vaccines under development and they're in many different forms. Some are new using RNA alone. Some are new using virus like particles which are made in a laboratory. And some are just classical vaccine, which is like the measles vaccine or another vaccine where there's a vaccine backbone and then the virus is placed on that backbone 
and it's used as a vaccine. So all of these different methodologies are underway. Many, many different studies and development activities in small biotechs and some of the larger um, companies as well. But it's not yet certain that a vaccine can be developed. It's our hope. But it's not certain that a vaccine that is effective can be developed. We don't yet understand a lot about the immune response that this organism provides that would provide to a vaccine as well as to uh, natural disease. So there are lots of questions to be unanswered, to be answered at present, a lot unanswered. And so we just have to hope that there will be an effective vaccine, that it will be available sometime next year, and that there will be the production capacity to make enough of this vaccine for the world. And all these measures are being studied by the Wellcome Trust, by others, including the Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness and Innovation based in, Geneva, in London. Um, pivoting then to talk a little bit about, about India and um, the state of play there. We were chatting briefly before we, we, we went started broadcasting about India. Can you give us just a little bit of a state of play there? It's obviously a, a, you know, a, a country where we have an enormous investment in it, uh, in being a success just given the scale, the world's largest democracy, the, um, the sheer level of humanity um, uh, in India. Yes, well, I, I just actually heard a presentation today by uh, the Ministry of Health of India through a WHO meeting that I was attending. And um, India is right at the beginning of what might be a major outbreak or might not. It's not yet known what's happening. They're beginning to ramp up their testing capabilities. They're beginning to ramp up their surveillance systems in general to try to determine exactly what it is that um, is going on in India. But they don't understand completely yet all the problems, but it could be a very major issue in India, which already has very fragile health systems and health, uh, health facilities in some parts of the country. Um, you mentioned WHO, and we spoke a little bit yesterday with Peter Droback a little uh, about um, uh, you know, the, the defunding or the pause on funding or the, the criticism of WHO um, uh, coming out of the US and from the Trump administration. Um, and I'm, I, I'd like to sort of dig into that a little bit just to try and understand. Um, first, for those people who are not sort of um, totally au fait with exactly what WHO is doing at this moment. Can you just give a, a sort of a, a sense of what it can do, what it can't do, what it is responsible for, what it's not responsible for? Because it's, I think there's just a, a kind of fact um, vacuum, at, at, least from, from, at least from the initial part of the conversation. Yeah, well, WHO is a vital organization for the world. First of all, in Geneva, at the WHO headquarters, it's a clearinghouse for information and for evidence that comes in from all countries on what they're doing, what's working, what's not working in the fight against this virus. And by being able to pull all of these people together informally and formally through external advisory groups, they've been able to help the world understand very rapidly much about this infection. In fact, most that we know has come from all these people working together technically through WHO. WHO can continue to function despite these political, geopolitical tensions. In fact, today at another meeting with WHO, there was the head of the United States Center for Disease Control and Tony Fauci, the head of NIH, who were also participating in that meeting, providing their expertise, as do experts from around the world, to WHO's activities on understanding and making guidelines for the outbreak. In addition, then, WHO has country offices that help countries do that difficult risk assessment in each country and also to determine what are the best strategies that they can use, what's most feasible and what might be most effective. So WHO is crucial both at the global level and at the um, level, of, at the country level. I myself worked with um, the Center for Disease Control in the U.S. for uh, almost 25 years. And during that period, I was in Africa and Asia and then at the World Health Organization. And I clearly could see the benefit of WHO in each of the assignments that I had from the Center for Disease Control. And it's very distressing and disappointing to me as an American that there should be such political play with WHO funding at this point. 
I don't know if I would be interested to learn a little bit more about the funding streams within WHO and what, what might be impacted if the US does withhold the funds. It would be via, I, I was about to ask that the implications of this are obviously the most important for everybody to try and understand. So yeah, please. Well, WHO has two budgets. It has what's called its core budget, which is paid for by assessed contributions of each member country. There are actually um, 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 a formula that decides what each country should be paying. And that's based on the GDP of these countries after World War II. So you can see it's a bit outdated, but it's never been updated because countries don't want it to be. And so as a result, the US does pay the most uh, towards the permanent budget, the core budget of WHO. In addition, the United States pays extra budgetary funding for projects that are of great interest to the United States. And this includes polio eradication, this includes AIDS, this includes neglected tropical diseases, it includes activities such as surveillance in developing countries, a whole series of activities that are paid for by the extra budgetary funding of WHO. So if these funds would be cut, there would be an impact on polio eradication, a major impact because the US is one of three major donors, uh, one of four major donors to polio, which includes the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, Rotary International and the United Kingdom. There would be a great gap in that and there would be a risk to polio eradication. So it's just to tell you that the WHO has two budgets and that if the US does stop its budget to, to funding to extra budgetary programs, there will be a major impact in countries. The technical activities of WHO done with core funding could continue, but there would be an impact on country activities. So you, you would have to imagine that there would have to be something of a major breakdown in governance or a significant um, scandal related to performance or execution or activities in the field or some form of policy or some kind of communication that would occasion a measure as dramatic as this because the public health consequences for you know globally are, are non-trivial um, and as I understand it, part of it stems from a WHO communication in January pertaining to China. Is that the sort of uh, the ostensible critique that's, that's emerged or, or is there some other reason, at least on the surface or at least as articulated for, for the cut? Well, you know, I don't understand the political level at all of WHO right now. I'm working at the technical level. And my, my reply to that would be that it's not the time for anybody to begin to make political accusations against the World Health Organization or any other country. We need to be working together to solve the problems associated with this pandemic and hopefully bring it to an end. And that's what needs to be done rather than political uh, posturing back and forth between different organizations. And I think the World Health Organization has been very graceful in how it's approached this to um, its statements back to the United States government. And I think also there have been some very powerful statements from Bloomberg, from the Gates Foundation, which has um, offered that it will pay an extra $120 million for country programs. There's a whole group of people who are rallying behind the World Health Organization. And hopefully the US Congress, when they review this recommendation, will find that it is not something which should be regarded and it, the WHO should continue to be funded. Um, I want to ask a question, partly, you know, relying on your technical expertise around mortality rates, because it seems to me right now in our mortality rates are of significance across the board, but they in some visceral way for politicians and for citizens, not for experts, they kind of give you a sense of how real and present the risk is from this virus. And therefore, when you decide when the lockdown is eased, what all of our attitudes are to, um, to going back uh, into what was uh, our prior normal lives. And um, it seems to me that we have both at a numerator and at a denominator level, some real statistical challenges at a 
at a denominator level, by that I mean the number of people who are infected, we have spotty testing uh, using, you know, different methodologies across different countries with wildly uneven projections. We've got loads of people who get it and are asymptomatic. So it's hard to sort of get a really accurate grasp on the number of people who have it. And then on the mortality rate level, which at least on one level would seem to be harder to kind of fudge, we have this phenomenon of both undercounted deaths in care homes where you're not having people properly tested. And you're also having um, deaths out in the community, not in hospitals, outside of care homes where people are dying at home, where we're not doing testing and therefore it's hard to make a definitive conclusion as to what was the cause of death. And so I guess my question is, um, do you have, with any degree of precision, a sense of how dangerous this disease really is? Um, and if we don't, there are some consequences for that, right? Yes, well, we know that it's a very serious risk to people over 70, and especially those who have comorbidities. And those are the people who need to pay special attention to protecting themselves by social distancing, by physical distancing, and by making sure that if there's someone in their household who is sick, that they're wearing some kind of protection over their face so that they're not coughing and sneezing directly on the elderly. So the elderly are at great risk of mortality. We do know from data coming out of China, and this was just presented to a WHO group on Tuesday, that the mortality ratio, that is the number of deaths and the number of people infected in Wuhan, where they were only examining people and going into the hospital, was about 4%. But in the communities outside of Wuhan and outside of the Hubei province where there were outbreaks, mortality was much less than 1%, case, the mortality ratio. So we're just beginning to understand mortality. And as you've said, Paul, it depends on the denominator, which includes less serious cases than we're seeing now in the hospitals where most of the testing is going on. But there are other deaths also in the community, as you point out that are not COVID deaths, that are other deaths. And the death toll, unfortunately, will be very high during this period uh, of the last two or three months. So just using your China example for a moment, um, and again, when I explore these conversations, it's always, my tendency has, has been up to now to try and say this is extraordinarily serious. We have to pay a lot of attention to it. We have to get ahead of the epidemi epidemiological curve so that it doesn't increase. Um, but on the other side of it, as we begin to emerge, I think there is an equal and opposite risk of overestimating the risk and thereby delaying our return to normality. Um, and if you're if your China numbers are right, um, which of course they are, and if there's a lot of people, if the morbidity rates outside of hospitals is under 1%, and that's presumably a lot, much larger number of people, and if in fact the mortality rate for this disease turns out when properly understood in retrospect to be under 1% in total, which is not inconceivable, would it mean that one would that would have a consequence for policy? Well, you know, the big difficulty in unlocking a society is um, the balance between saving lives and saving the economy. And that's a real, real difficult issue for governments to deal with. And governments are having difficulty dealing with it. But the, the lock and the lockdown in itself brings other problems, such as increasing the inequalities. So it's a very difficult issue. Um, and all these things have to be taken into the formula for a final understanding. But Paul, you know, the most important thing is that we, should, we need to understand that each one of us can contribute to stopping this pandemic by understanding how to protect ourselves and how to protect others if we're sick. And if we play our role in this, there doesn't need to be forced physical distancing. There can be physical distancing which we're going to adhere to, which is what Sweden is trying. Sweden is trying to get their population to be solid there, to have a solidarity, and to understand that they have the power to modify this pandemic. 
it's not yet clear whether they're having success in that, but they've locked down very little in Sweden, and they're trying to get the population to do the job for them, which makes a lot of sense. And that may be what has to happen in many developing countries, especially in Africa. But for now, um, we have to all understand that if there is, when the lockdown occurs, if we want it to continue, we have to be practicing social and physical distancing, washing our hands, staying away from people who are sick if we can. And if people are sick, if we are sick, we should wear a mask to protect others from our droplets when we cough or sneeze. And, and to your point around Sweden, are you, um, I, I often put Sweden and Norway alongside each other to look at the kind of rate of the curve and those, they're, they're dramatically different in, in how they have um, dealt with the epidemic. And it may be that Norway has inflicted greater harm and economic harm and Sweden has done less economic harm, but, um, uh, but, but correspondingly, um, experienced a greater loss of life. Um, so do I infer from what you're saying that you think that Sweden is in fact a, from a public health perspective, uh, a it's, it's not an irresponsible set of choices that have been, are being made there? Sweden continues to do what countries do in all outbreaks. They identify cases, they isolate them in a hospital and they manage those patients. At the same time, they trace their contacts they test the contacts to see if any are infected at the time they're identified, and they put them under surveillance for two weeks to see if they develop fever or signs of COVID, and then they're tested again. So they're doing exactly what the classic outbreak containment measures are. They haven't done a lot of other, in other containment activities except for trying to empower their population with the knowledge of how they can protect themselves and prevent others from getting infected while making sure that their hospital staff are safe and there's no infection prevention or control activities that are being neglected in hospitals. So all this together is their strategy. And you know, the jury is still out as to which strategies will work best, but they have a sound strategy and uh, they are uh, witnessing a slight increase in patients who are, being, um, who are dying, but this is, a reflection of three weeks ago, not of the present. So we'll see what happens in three weeks as time goes on. And a final question for me. Um, the mayor of, of Los Angeles, Eric Garcetti, uh, yesterday um, said something that I think people thought was inevitable, but it was still arresting when it was said, which was there, there are going to be a long time um, before we have concerts uh, and sports games and, and get into um, you know, large arenas. Um, Boston University, I believe, has just said that it will only have its classes taught from 2021. Um, and we're sitting in April um, and, and looking at at least another eight months um, on those two timelines from a Los Angeles point of view and from a higher education point of view where what we had taken for granted is now going to not occur, which is to go to classes in university and to go to stadia and football field, football games or soccer, sports games or, or, or concerts. Um, do you think that those are all the correct decisions? Well, you know, they're decisions based on an understanding that this virus would remain in human populations until that period of time and continue to spread at the same rate it's doing now. When a new virus enters human populations, it's really not certain what the final destiny is. And I don't think we know yet what the destiny of this virus is. Some people are predicting it will decrease in transmissibility during the summer months. Not clear whether that's true or not. Certainly, it's, it's uh, being able to transmit very easily in Singapore right now. Others are talking about different um, scenarios that the population will all be immune and it won't be able to transmit anymore. We don't understand that for sure. We believe that there isn't a high percentage of population infected based on what we're understanding from China and from some of the serological surveys that are looking for people who have evidence of having past infection in many countries around the world. So we, we just don't know enough about this virus. So what these are are precautionary measures 
that are being taken in the event that the virus does remain in human populations, as have some other viruses that have emerged, such as HIV, and such as seasonal influenza, which comes from um, wild waterfowl. But at the same time, some of these infections disappear completely. Um, the H1N1 pandemic of influenza occurred, and then it disappeared, and it's no longer present. So it's not clear what the final destiny of this virus is, but people are taking, and rightfully so, precautionary measures to be sure that they are prepared should this virus remain around human populations. I'm going to ask a final, final question, uh, which is, um, we spoke about vaccines, but I'm always very interested in, from as many sort of s s smart people with medical training as possible to, to kind of ask the treatment question, um, because vaccines take long, promising treatments, if they can lower mortality rates, seem quicker, more amenable, and, and, and would be more reassuring to people if we knew that effective treatments more, were widely available. Anything that you can say of promise on that front? Unfortunately, there are no clinical trials that have been completed yet that would say whether drugs such as hydroxychloroquine or such as remdesivir or even as azithromycin, the antibiotic, are effective. Some of these drugs have been shown to be effective in the laboratory in killing the virus, but the laboratory isn't humans. And so clinical trials must be done in order that you can determine whether or not there is an advantage to using these drugs. And those trials are underway in many, many countries, including the UK. So within the next two or three weeks, we'll begin to see whether some of these drugs that have been touted to be effective, such as hydroxychloroquine, are really effective. Initial data doesn't suggest that it is effective, but there will be clinical trials that will be um, available in the next few weeks, which will give that answer. So in two or three weeks' time, it's not inconceivable that we find something which may significantly reduce mortality rates on the treatment front, not on the vaccine front. Nothing that will happen, but that's not inconceivable that, that, that we could discover that. That's right. If one of these drugs should be shown to be effective, then we would have an indication, we would have a, a new way of dealing with this virus. But um, unfortunately, some of the studies that were done in China, which didn't have the statistical power that was necessary on all three of these uh, medications, have not, been, uh, have not shown a positive trend. But we still don't know from well-controlled clinical trials with adequate populations whether or not they will be effective. So the jury is still out, and I can't make a prediction about whether any of them will be useful or not. Well, Dr. David Heyman, I'm very grateful for your time and for your expertise and for answering all of our questions, and as I'm sure our community is as well. So thank you very much, and um, stay safe and stay well. Thank you, Paul. Same to you. Goodbye, everybody.